Good day and welcome to the fourth in the series of lectures hosted by Project Solutions Limited. Um, Project Solutions are an engineering design and project management company uh, with offices in Yorkshire and Teesside. Uh, my name is Brian Lawson and as well as working at Project Solutions as the technical director, I'm also the chair of the Yorkshire region of the IMECE. Um, these lectures uh, don't happen uh, by magic. There's plenty of people working in the background um, and uh, we have to thank um, Nikki Baxter from the Yorkshire region IMECE who does all of uh, our hard work in the back office so thanks Nikki and with this series we're collaborating with um, headquarters at Birdcage Walk so thanks to Lucy Esmond and her team uh, we have uh, Fiona Wong supporting us today with the WorkCast platform. Um, we've previously run these lectures uh, for the Yorkshire region and have proved very, very popular, had great feedback. That's due very much to the excellent support offered by Sparrow Sarko UK um, and the brilliant delivery of the lecture uh, by uh, Dan Wells. Um, additionally, with this series, we've got um, Stephen Bishop, uh, one of Dan's colleagues at Sparrow Sarko, and he'll be helping uh, with questions as they arrive um, through chat um, during during the lecture uh, in readiness for Dan to answer at the end. Just a little bit of logistics uh, for your information. Uh, questions can be asked through the during the lecture via the WorkCast uh, chat line. Uh, we will answer them at the end uh, rather than interrupt the flow. Uh, the lecture will be recorded um, and it'll be posted on the IMEC -E, uh, YouTube channel um, if it takes a, a short while to get up there. Um, and also, uh, just a shout out for regional committees, the IMEC -E regional committees. If anybody online wishes to get more involved uh, with their local IMEC -E regional committee, um, either contact me via LinkedIn and I'll put you in touch with the relevant person, or follow the links on the IMEC -E, uh, website. The majority of things that happen uh, in the IMEC -E are made happen by volunteers, uh, and we've always got a spare seat if anybody wants to join us. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Dan. Hopefully, you will enjoy another brilliant lecture by Dan. So, on you, Dan. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction, Brian. I'd also like to say a big thank you to everyone at IMECI West Yorkshire and also the team at uh, National Head Office for IMEC. Uh, much appreciated and we, uh, we're, we're very grateful for the opportunity to present this series of lectures. As we go through today's uh, lectures, uh, today's lecture, please don't hesitate to drop any questions that may arise into the chat function, and we'll address those once we get to the end of today's session. So we've, we've been uh, afforded the opportunity to deliver a full suite of presentations over the last few, uh, few weeks and in the coming weeks over uh, a different range of topics concerning the wider steam and condensate loop. And today we're going to look in a little bit more detail about the subject of steam trapping itself. So we've introduced ourselves previously to give you an understanding for who Spyrax Sarco is as an organisation. We are a UK based organisation, but we do have officers and representatives that are based around the globe. However, as far as here in the UK is concerned, we're a team that's approximately 200 strong. And what we need to remember is our team uh, here in the UK are based, 50% uh, of us are work from the office and approximately 50% of the team are uh, based at home. So we're always on hand to be able to support you with any requirements you may have on your individual site or offices. But we've also got a considerable number of resources that are available online in the form of calculators, configurators, but also in the form of those very useful little apps that you can download to your iPhone or to your smartphone that can assist you with any calculations that you may need to do with regards to the wider steam and condensate loop. So on with today's presentation, as you can see, it's on the title of steam trapping. 
So we're going to look at what I personally believe to be the single most important component of the steam and condensate loop. That's the steam trap itself. So it's important to understand that if we don't select, size, install, or maintain the steam trap correctly, then we're never going to have a steam distribution network that's working efficiently, safely, or is producing steam uh, cost-effective or um, very uh, uh, at a very costly uh, point from a, an energy efficiency perspective. So today's presentation is quite a high-level presentation. It's quite fast-paced, but hopefully it should provide you with some very useful insights to bear in mind whenever you're next involved with engineering a STEAM system. So I want to start off with the basics, first of all, and I want us to fully appreciate what STEAM is and why we need to treat it completely differently to any other sources of energy, such as hot water or thermal oils. And that's because steam's a gas. And as we've mentioned in the previous presentations we've gone through, that gas is compressible. In other words, if we're generating and distributing that steam at a high pressure, the volume can be compressed. The benefit being we can distribute it in a small, nominable bore pipework. We also know that we've got that direct pressure to temperature relationship that we've spoken about. By controlling the pressure, we're manipulating the temperature. High pressure steam has got a high temperature, a lower pressure steam has got a lower temperature. So you remember that that makes it very, very easy to control the temperature of the steam at the process using a very simple two port valve. We've mentioned that there's a considerable amount of heat energy present in a kilogram of steam compared to a kilogram of water, up to 50 times more energy present in a kilogram of steam compared to LTHW that could be working on an 11 degree delta T. And we remember that that information is really based on the understanding that water, the raw ingredient of a steam system, Water's got a specific heat capacity of 4.19, meaning if we want to increase the temperature of one kilogram of water by just one degree, well, we need to add 4.19 kilojoules of energy to it. That information is the cornerstone of the steam tables that we'll come on and review in a couple of slides time. We also know steam as a gas, well, we don't pump it. It moves in accordance with the pressure drop around the distribution network. So we need a good motive pressure, not only to push the steam towards the process, but to then energize the condensate and push the condensate across the steam trap so it can return back to the boiler house again. We also know that steam as a gas, it gives up its heat energy equally and evenly across the entirety of the heat transfer surface area. So do you remember from the presentation we went through two weeks ago when we looked at the uses of steam for heat exchange applications, we mentioned that that equal and efficient use of heat, the heat transfer surface area is just one of the reasons why we need a smaller heat exchanger when we're using steam compared to using water. We also know that because steam gives up its heat energy by condensing, the speed of heat transfer is approximately three times greater than with a water-to-water -water heat exchanger. But this particular presentation itself, we're looking at steam trapping. So it's important to understand that when steam gives up its heat energy, it condenses. But it's only actually its latent heat energy that it gives up. That means there's a reasonable amount of heat energy left back in that liquid condensate. So moving forward onto a slide that I've shown on a number of occasions now, and I make no apology for going through this again, it's critically important to understand the basics of this particular slide, especially when it comes to steam trapping. So over towards the left-hand side of the screen, we've got the steam tables themselves. So the information shown in the steam tables is firstly, the pressure that the steam is either generated, distributed or condensed at, and we can see the temperature that the steam has at that known pressure. The first column, that's the sensible heat energy. That tells us how much energy we need to put into the water to make it change state to produce or to start to reach boiling point. We call it the sensible heat. We can also call it the 
um, the enthalpy of water. The next column, that shows us what we refer to as the enthalpy of evaporation, which we also refer to as the latent heat. That's the energy that we need to put into that boiling water to enable it to fully evaporate and produce a mass of steam. So if we add the two together, we then get the total heat present in the steam. And the final column, it tells us that if we know the pressure that the steam is being generated or distributed at, then we know the volume. And as you can see, if we increase the pressure, then all of these values are changing from the temperature to the energy that's present to the volume. So it's important to understand that when steam gives up its heat energy at the process, it condenses. It changes state from a gas to a liquid. It's actually only the enthalpy of evaporation. That's the energy that is passed across the thermal barrier and into the process. So that means that the energy that's left behind in that liquid condensate, the byproduct, is exactly the same as the sensible heat or the energy that we added into that boiling water to make it evaporate. So over towards the right hand side of the screen, you can see what we refer to as the temperature enthalpy curve. And this demonstrates the journey that water takes as it changes state from a liquid to that steam as a gas. So if we use the example of zero bar gauge, we know that water boils at 100 degrees. If we multiply that 100 by the 4.19 kilojoules per kilogram sensible heat, the water is going to boil once we've added 419 kilojoules of energy to it. But that boiling water is only going to fully evaporate once we've added that latent heat energy to it. And it's at this point we can say that we've got dry saturated steam. So you remember from previous presentations, we've highlighted how wet steam is the biggest enemy of a well-designed steam distribution network. Simply put, the wetter the steam, the greater the heat loss, the greater the condensate load is going to be on the distribution pipe work. And the greater the heat loss, the greater the inefficiency. If we've got more condensate in the pipe work, we've got to install a greater number of steam traps to drain that condensate away. That's going to be at some capital cost. It also means we're at greater risk of erosion, corrosion and water hammer. And because the steam's wet, it means we're at a greater risk of that moisture contaminating an atmosphere. And it also means that that steam is going to have less energy contained within it. So the information shown on the steam tables, it can also tell us that pressure to volume relationship. Kilogram of water in the boiler, it's going to have a volume of 0 0.001 cubic meters. Once that water's changed state to produce steam as a gas at zero bar gauge, it's going to have a volume that is approximately 1,673 times greater in volume. Same mass, but a huge, huge volume. But if we generate and distribute that steam under pressure, well, you can see that we've greatly compressed that volume so that the same mass at 10 bar gauge is going to occupy a volume of approximately 0.177 cubic meters. That essentially tells us that the benefit of distributing steam at a high pressure and reducing its volume, but it also tells us what happens when we get a significant fall in pressure. You can see that means we get an expansion and that needs to be accommodated in the pipework. Steam tables also tell us that there's a pressure to temperature relationship. We know at zero bar gauge, water boils at 100 degrees. And therefore, we can say that the temperature of the steam that's produced at, at zero bar gauge is also 100. If we're producing or distributing steam at a higher pressure, let's say 10 bar, the boiling point is higher and therefore the temperature of the steam is higher. So this demonstrates the benefit of being able to manipulate the temperature by controlling the pressure. But the steam saturation line also shows us something else. And this is the point at which steam gives up its heat energy and condenses. So at 10 bar gauge, the steam that gives up its heat energy 
either to the distribution pipe work or to the heat exchanger, it's going to exist at 184 degrees. When it gives up its energy and condensers, there's a change of state from a gas to a liquid, but there isn't an exchange of temperature. So that means whenever condensate is exposed to the same pressure as the steam, it is going to exist at the same temperature, just as a different phase. So now we've understood the basics, we've had a review of the fundamentals. Hopefully we've got an appreciation for why we need to remove that condensate. The condensate is a liquid. It's got significantly less heat energy in it. So we need to get it away from the process to ensure the process can operate at an optimum rate. And we need to get it away from the distribution pipe work to protect the steam system from erosion, corrosion, water hammer, to prevent the process from being contaminated with excess water, and also to ensure the energy content in the steam is as high as it possibly can be. There's no value to the process or the distribution network in leaving the condensate there. But if we can get that condensate across the trap and back to the boiler house, remember, we can use that condensate to help us to generate steam in the energy center more efficiently. So one thing that is worth mentioning is that different processes are going to use steam for different applications and for different purposes. So typically, when we're talking about a, a general traditional steam system that may be used on a closed loop heat exchanger, well, we know the benefits of keeping that steam as dry as possible, more energy in it, and there's less likelihood of mechanical damage. But for certain processes, especially where steam is going to be used for direct injection purposes, for example, in the food, beverage, pharmaceutical, fine chemical sector, we don't want to be contaminating an atmosphere or um, a product with excess moisture, excess water. And that water is going to be chemically conditioned as well. So we could be ca causing a point of contamination. So we know there's a benefit in keeping the steam dry. So not just are we removing the risk of contamination there, but it also means that the drier the steam, the more energy there is contained within the steam. There are also going to be benefits in, in ensuring that there's very little air and other non-condensable gases present in the steam, all of which steam traps can assist with. So certain high-end processors are going to have a greater uh, requirement or a greater degree of criticality when it comes to steam trapping. And that's typically governed by a standard referred to as BSEN285. So you'll notice there that air venting is also mentioned as a significant problem in a steam distribution network if we fail to vent that air away. And the reasons are primarily, one, an excess of air can create corrosion of the steam distribution network itself. But an even bigger problem is the fact that any film of air can be a significant barrier to heat exchange. It's got an insulating effect, as you can see demonstrated in the, in the middle of the screen here. But that insulating effect also means that we are then no longer able to rely on that pressure to temperature relationship to break down the energy that passes into the process. So we always encourage you to utilize um, a thermostatic air vent, both at the process and at the very, very end of the distribution pipe work to allow the air to be uh, passed away from the network. So we always refer to air venting um, as a completely separate issue, but at the same time as steam trapping. So just to take that one step further, I want to show you the example of a typical process here. Now, on this occasion, we're looking at a jacketed vessel but it could easily apply to any other heat exchanger, such as a shell and tube or a plate heat exchanger. Certain steam trap types have got the capability of being able to vent away not only condensate, but also air, especially when the system is starting up from cold. And that's a huge benefit because the more air we can vent away, the quicker we can bring the process up to temperature. So, the primary purpose of a, a steam trap is to vent condensate away. So the condensate is going to fall under gravity as a heavier liquid. So it makes sense to fit the steam trap 
at the bottom of the heat exchanger. So once the system has been operational for a, a few minutes, for a short period of time, the steam is going to pass, it's going to push a bubble of air past the condensate takeoff. So at that point, without any air vent being present, we would have a bubble of air, an insulating film of air being airlocked within the heat exchanger itself. So that means there'd be a, a huge area of space that the steam simply couldn't occupy. So we'd be exposed to an unequal and uneven transfer of energy from the steam into the process and ultimately a slowdown in the process. The process time would extend and extend. So yes, we want to ensure that the air can be vented from the low point, but it's just as important to ensure that any air that has passed the condensate takeoff leg can be vented away from the high point. So that's the reason why we encourage you to think about air venting in the same breath as steam trapping, but as an entirely separate issue. If we'd fail to air vent at the top of the heat exchanger, then that's when we're putting ourselves at risk of an insulating film of air having an adverse effect on the process. So why do we need a steam trap? Why don't we just let that condensate pass straight out of the solution and be dumped to waste? Well, there are a number of different reasons. The first and most obvious reason is that not only would we be losing the condensate, but we would be losing a significant mass of steam to atmosphere. There'd be a huge, huge inefficiency. And also there's a value in that liquid condensate as well. So by locking the steam in the network, we're increasing the overall efficiency of the distribution network. But by allowing the condensate to drain away and get it recovered back to the boiler house, we can reuse all of that heat energy that is present within the liquid condensate. And that's going to help us to bring the boiler back up to the point where it can generate steam rapidly and efficiently. So I want to move forward and look at the different areas where condensate is actually formed or produced. So condensate exists wherever steam gives up its heat energy, wherever there's a heat loss. So first of all, that can be in the distribution pipe work itself and it can be at the process. They're the two different areas where we're going to get condensate. So when we're talking about the distribution pipe work, we typically work on a rule of thumb that approximately 2% of all the steam that is being generated is going to give up its heat energy and change state to liquid condensate in the distribution pipe work. So if we're generating 10,000 kilograms per hour of steam, we expect that we're going to need to remove approximately 200 kilograms per hour of condensate. Now that can vary depending upon how wet the steam is, how far we're distributing the steam, is it in a correctly sized pipe work? Is it raining outdoors, for example? All of that can have a slight effect on the exact heat loss. 2% seems to suffice for the vast majority of sizing applications, but we always double that 2%. The 2% is what we refer to as um, the heat loss or the running load in a system that's been operational at a nice high temperature for a, a certain period of time. The infrastructure's been brought up to temperature. But in the first hour or so, if we're warming a steam system up from cold, more and more of the steam is going to give up its heat energy to the infrastructure itself, even before it gets to the process. We refer to that as the warming upload. So we always double that warming upload to allow for the greater mass of condensate that will need to be re removed from the network when we're bringing it up to temperature. So that 200 kilograms per hour running load will become 400 kilogram per hour warming up load. And that's what we want to size the steam traps on. If we undersize the steam traps, if we only size them on the running load, then we're exposing ourselves to the risk that that condensate is likely to back up and start to flood the distribution network. And it's at that point we get that erosion, corrosion and water hammer that we spoke about. And the remainder of the, uh, the remainder of the condensate, well, that's going to be formed at the process. And that's a good thing because that's where we want the steam to give up its heat energy. And just as we apply a warming upload, 
then it's good work in practice to apply, apply a warming up load of maybe two, maybe even three times. So we've got a safety factor there to ensure that the condensate can always be drained away from the process. Remember, if the condensate is held back in the heat exchanger, it's at that point that the rate of heat transfer is going to extend and extend. So in the distribution network, the steam and therefore the condensate is going to exist at a high temperature and at a high pressure. But at the process, we will have reduced the pressure of the steam and therefore the pressure of the condensate and the temperature of the condensate will exist at a much lower point at this, at this uh, application at the process itself. So that essentially means that we're going to need to contend with the removal of condensate at different areas, different pressures, temperatures, mass flows. So for that reason, we need to remember there's no such thing as a one size fits all universal steam trap. Each steam trap needs to be sized and selected in accordance with the pressures, temperatures, mass flows, and also the other considerations that the trap is going to be exposed to. For example, is there a lot of temperature variation? Is there going to be a certain amount of air locking or is it going to be exposed to freezing conditions? All of these considerations are going to point us towards a number of different options for steam trap selection. So the basic steam trap types will operate in a number of different ways. And they fall into one of three different categories. We've got the thermodynamic traps. We've got the thermostatic traps and we've got the mechanical traps. So looking very quickly at each of these types in turn, first and foremost, we've got the thermodynamic or TD trap. And this essentially operates um, by allowing the condensate that's going to exist at a very cold point once the steam system's energized. It's going to exist under pressure, but at a cold temperature. We use the steam pressure to push that condensate across the trap. It's pressurized and it moves up through a narrow orifice. The pressure of the condensate pushes a little disc into the head of the trap and that condensate is then pressurized at which point it can move back to the boiler house. But once the condensate gets to a temperature that's higher and higher, typically above 100 degrees, well, as that steam is pressurizing the condensate and pushing it down this narrow orifice, there's going to be a very small falling pressure. And that falling pressure is going to result in a small amount of flash steam. And remember, flash steam exists at a much greater volume than um, liquid condensate does. So that huge expansion is going to have an effect on manipulating this little disc in the head of the trap. And as the flash steam condenses and gives up its energy against the head of the this nut, the head of the trap, it's going to condense, its volume is going to collapse, it's going to pull a vacuum. So this little disc is rising and falling. So it's allowing the steam pressure to constantly spit out a very small mass of high temperature, high pressure condensate. So if we're ever stood next to this trap in, in operation, we should hear two things. We should hear the operation of the little disc clacking open and closed, and we should hear a quite a violent blast action of the condensate being discharged uh, to waste. So there are benefits and there are disadvantages of this type of trap. Um, the benefits, it's very small, it's robust, it's compact, it's easy to install, Providing we've observed the directional flow, uh, we can install it in any plane. If it is exposed to freezing condensate, um, it isn't going to cause any damage. Once the steam system is uh, switched on and pressurized again, that condensate will thaw out and the trap will operate as it did previously without any damage. Um, on the downside, we do need to ensure that we're venting away any air that is present in the steam distribution network upstream of this trap. And that's because it simply cannot tell the difference between steam and air. So any air that is present will cause what we refer to as air locking. The other thing to bear in mind is we'd never lag this type of trap. 
And that's because we need to allow for that flash steam to condense very, very quickly. If we lagged it, there'd be a delay in the rate of that steam, flash steam condensing. In other words, we'd be derating the capacity of this type of trap by lagging it. Very, very popular on steam distribution networks. We'd never encourage you to use this type of trap at the process itself. Simply got too, too lower capacity. Another common trap type is what we refer to as the thermostatic trap. It works on the temperature difference between the steam and the condensate. So that means we need to allow the condensate the opportunity to cool down. We need what's referred to as a cooling leg between the process or the distribution pipe work and the steam trap. And that cooling leg needs to be unlagged. And by allowing the condensate to fall by a certain number of degrees, typically anywhere between 10 and 20 degrees, it means that this trap is going to register a fall in temperature. It will open and the steam pressure or gravity will then allow the condensate to drain away where it can be recovered. So this type of trap, it works very, very well if we've got a lot of air that's present within the steam, especially on startup because it works thermostatically, that air will be allowed to drain away. And it also means that this type of trap is very, very well received on heat exchangers or processes that need to be brought up to temperature very, very quickly. Maybe we've got a process where we've got a lot of flash steam that's vented away or an inefficiency. And if that is the case, then a thermostatic trap works well because it allows the condensate to cool down, thereby minimizing those flash steam losses. The thing to bear in mind is that cooling leg should be unlagged and it is designed with the intention of allowing that condensate to cool down. And then we've got the mechanical traps and the mechanical traps, they work on the density principle. It could be the float trap, as you can see at the top of the screen, or it could be the inverted bucket trap that you can see at the bottom of the screen. They both work on the density principle. Condensate as a liquid is heavier than steam as a gas. And therefore, we've got the buoyancy of either a float or a bucket that will operate, manipulate a little valve that will allow the condensate to leave the network or the process, but it will lock that valuable steam in. The main differences between the float and the inverted bucket is that the float trap in the vast majority of cases will contain not only that mechanical valve, but it will also have a secondary thermostatic valve. So that means it will bleed away a significant amount of air that is present whenever the system is starting up from cold. But we've also got a secondary thermostatic valve, meaning that the trap's got a greater capacity when that condensate is cold. The inverted bucket trap is very, very well placed because it can stand up very, very well to water hammer or a poor condition of steam, whereas the float trap isn't necessarily able to do that. We also encourage you to lag a mechanical trap because, as you can see, there's always going to be a certain amount of condensate held back. And if that condensate were to freeze, that's when it's likely to cause damage to the trap mechanism itself. So trapping or a little bit of um, trace heating is always recommended if these traps are going to be left outside for, for long periods of time. So moving forwards, um, I just want to reiterate what condensate actually is and how do we need to size the pipe work between the process itself and the steam trap. So if we've got a process that is calling for 100 kilograms per hour steam, we know that when steam gives up its heat energy and condensers, we're going to be left with the same mass of liquid condensate that needs to be removed. But remember that safety factor. So it's good working practice to ensure that when the steam is bringing the process up to temperature from cold, it's good working practice to double that or maybe even triple it in certain cases. So it'd be good working practice to size the pipework at this point here for the fact that you may need to remove two, maybe even 300 kilograms per hour of condensate. If this pipework were undersized, we run the risk that that condensate could back up and start to flood the process, at which point we've got a barrier to heat exchange. So sizing the pipework's uh, important, but it's equally important to ensure that we've sized the trap itself correctly. 
Now, an undersized trap, that's going to be self-explanatory. We could leave the condensate backing up to waterlog the network or to waterlog the heat exchanger, which is going to cause us problems. But we can have just as many problems by oversizing the trap. And that's because if we oversize the trap, it's far more likely that that disk or the valve seat is going to be operating far, far closer together for prolonged periods of time. So that's when we're going to get a trap failure through excessive erosion or abrasion. So I just want to look at a couple of very, very quick, typical steam trap sizing and selection examples. So the first example we're going to look at, it's a process. And the process is essentially using steam to heat a water tank. So we've got a coil in a tank. You can see that we've got steam pressure at four bar gauge. We've got an open-ended line. So we've got, we express that as being a four bar gauge pressure drop or differential. And you can see that we're condensing 200 kilograms per hour of steam when the process is running. So because it's a process that's required to remove a significant amount of condensate in a short period of time, we're going to use a float trap or an FT. So every steam trap type has got its own sizing curve. So if you look at the red line that we've identified here, the red line that runs vertically upwards, that's representative of that four bar gauge differential pressure that we've spoken about. The green line, that's the 200 kilograms per hour condensate load that we've spoken about. So when the two intersect, that shows us how we select the appropriate steam trap type. But remember, we've got that running load as well as the warming up load we need to contend with. So the green line represents the, war, uh, the running load. The orange line represents the warming up load. In other words, we've doubled the running load. So if we look where the orange line and the red line intersect, that shows us how we've now correctly sized and selected the appropriate steam trap. So on this occasion, it's what we'd refer to as uh, an FT14 4.5. The, the 14 is essentially representative of the maximum pressure rating of the casting and the 4.5, it tells us the acceptable differential pressure. So on this occasion, you can see that we've uh, correctly sized and selected the appropriate steam trap for the process. But if we're looking at removing the condensate from the distribution pipe work, then we've got a different set of criteria to consider. We mentioned that we could be distributing the steam at 8,000 kilograms per hour, at a pressure of eight bar gauge. And again, if we're discharging the trap to atmospheric, we would refer to that as having an eight bar differential pressure. And on this occasion, you can see we've got a secondary trap located here coming off the dirt pocket. It's what we refer to as a fixed discharge, fixed temperature discharge trap or an auto drain. Essentially, it works thermostatically. So that means whenever the steam system is switched off, any condensate that is languishing there um, at a very, very low temperature, it means it can drain to waste under gravity and be dumped to waste. That condensate doesn't have any value to us. It's low temperature. And if it's left there, it can cause more problems with erosion, corrosion and water hammer. So if that were the case, we wouldn't need to allow for the warming up load for this particular type of valve. That excess mass of condensate that was generated when the system was warming up and therefore at a low temperature would be dumped to waste by the secondary trap. We could have that occurring on some systems. On others, we're just going to deal with both the warming up load and the running load via the same trap. So let's look at the trap sizing example for the TD or thermodynamic trap. We know that's the best choice for this application because it's being used on the distribution network. And if we're distributing 8,000 kilograms per hour of steam, if we use that 2% rule of thumb to calculate the running load, we know that we need to remove 160 kilograms per hour. So where the green and red lines intersects, that's where we size the steam trap for the running load. In other words, if we have or if we have got 
that secondary auto drain in situ. If we haven't, and if we need the trap to accommodate both the running load and the warming up load, we need to double that 160 kilograms per hour to 320. And that then tells us how we've sized the appropriate trap. So if we'd used the, uh, the first of the two trap types to move both the running load and the warming up load, you can appreciate it would be hugely undersized. So there are many different applications where traps are going to be used. And for some processes, um, it's not unusual for us to require different types of steam traps at different areas of the process. They're going to have different functions. They could be moving condensate at different temperatures, pressures, mass flow rates, and they could be exposed to different criteria. The important thing is that we don't give thought to a steam trap as being a universal device. Each trap has to be sized and selected in accordance with each individual application. And other areas where traps should be used, it's of the bottom of those steam separators, ahead of pressure reducing valves or control valves to ensure that at any point where steam could potentially or the condensate could potentially become trapped, it is allowed to be drained away and dumped to waste or taken away back to the boiler house where it can be reused efficiently. So just moving on to the pipework sizing, we've mentioned upstream of the trap, the condensate at this point here, it is a liquid, it's under pressure. So as long as we've allowed for that safety factor, as long as we've multiplied the condensate load um, of two to three times of the running load, for example, then it's safe for us to move forward and size the pipework at this point here assuming that we're moving a water. We can use water sizing charts as is demonstrated over here towards the right hand side of the screen. We can even use the calculators or configurators that we have on those useful little apps. The thing to bear in mind is what actually happens once the steam has pressurized the condensate and moved it downstream of the trap. It's at this point here, we're going to see a fall in pressure. So going back to those steam tables, Using the example of seven bar gauge, the sensible heat present in the condensate at seven bar, 721 kilojoules. A fall in pressure downstream of the trap to zero bar gauge, the sensible heat of the condensate, 419. So that means there needs to be a significant fall in energy just at the same time as there's a fall in pressure of the condensate moving across the trap. So how can the condensate do that? Well, simply put, the sensible heat, it moves across the steam tables to become total heat. In other words, a certain mass or a certain percentage of that condensate, it changes state back to flash steam again. But the problem that brings us is, we've got that huge expansion to contend with. So that means downstream of the pipe, downstream of the trap, we need to size the pipe work to allow for that expansion. So in order to allow for that expansion, we need to treat condensate as a biphase. So we need to consider the fall in pressure. That's going to tell us the amount of expansion that we need to contend with in the flash steam, the mass flow rate of the condensate arriving in the trap, that's going to give us the information with regards to how we've accurately sized the condensate pipe work correctly, considering that condensate that has undergone a pressure drop needs to be considered a biphase. Again, the good news is you can refer to that useful calculator on co or configurator on the app, and that will help you with the sizing. But please, whenever there's a falling pressure of the condensate, please bear in mind there will be that expansion to contend with. So for that reason, we strongly encourage you to ensure that each individual process has got its own dedicated steam trap. And that's because processes are going to work at different rates, different temperatures, pressures, mass flow rates. So not only is there a different mass of condensate to remove across the trap, 
the flash steam, that volumetric increase is also going to be present at a different rate. And any flash steam that occurs and that expansion of that huge expansion of volume, it can create a significant back pressure on the trap. And that back pressure can prevent the condensate from leaving the system or the process, result in a slowing down of temperature, but also resulting in that erosion, corrosion and water hammer that we've spoken about. So we do encourage you to have an individual trap dedicated for each process. However, that's not to say that the condensate pipework can't come together and converge. So we're removing that condensate in a group line. All we need to do is allow for the pipework to step up incrementally in accordance with the increase in mass flow rate of liquid condensate, but also the increase in volume of that flash steam that is present. And once again, we can size the group condensate lines correctly by referring to that little app that we've spoken about. So hopefully you can appreciate that steam traps, they do need um, we do need a motive pressure in the steam to push the condensate across the trap to a lower pressure so the condensate can move. And hopefully you can appreciate that as mechanical devices, they are susceptible to failure. And that's typically when they're exposed to a poor condition of steam or condensate or when they've been incorrectly sized, incorrectly installed or incorrectly selected. So steam traps will typically fail in, in one of two conditions, open or closed. So when a steam trap's failed in the open position, then that steam is going to pass across the trap. It's going to become mixed in with the condensate and it's going to be vented away at some point, typically up a steam vent, as you can see over towards the right hand side of the screen. The problem is that that lot steam is representative of a significant loss of energy. And not only are we losing the energy, we're failing to recover the condensate that's a byproduct of heat exchange. So it can be difficult to spot this unless we're specifically keeping our, uh, our eyes open or checking our steam traps periodically. But the financial impact of repairing a failed open steam trap is very, very easily to calculate or quantify and that's because if we know the size of the steam trap that we have and the pressure that we're distributing the steam at if we know the operational hours per year of the steam plant and if we've benchmarked our cost of steam then the orifice size tells us we can very very easily calculate how much energy we're losing to atmosphere every year so in the case of looking at just one steam trap of a size of one inch six bar gauge that trap, it could be 300 pounds sterling to replace, but it could be representative of an energy loss that is significantly greater. So if you consider a steam using site that may have 500 steam traps with a failure rate of one in 10, you can appreciate why it's strongly recommended that sites would either have a periodic manual audit of the steam trap population or they'd have some kind of automatic Wi-Fi trap monitoring device for the more important and the greater steam users on that process. But of course, traps can and will fail in the in the closed position. And that's um, that's very difficult to quantify in financial terms. And a failed steam trap is going to have a different impact depending upon what we're talking about. If we're talking about a steam trap that's failed behind a heat exchanger, behind a process, that's going to be very easy to identify because the production manager is going to be, he's going to be shouting at the maintenance team pretty quickly. But if we consider a steam trap that could be failed where it's required to remove the distribution losses, well, we may not be aware of that. And over time, that condensate could back up and start to flood the distribution network. And it's at that point that we get the erosion, the corrosion, the water hammer. It's at that point that we find we get a greater heat loss and there's less and less energy present within the steam. So again, just to reiterate, that steam trap audit, the steam trap monitoring is critically important. I suppose the major difference is if we're able to undertake a periodic uh, manual audit, we're able to determine that the trap has been sized, selected and installed correctly, as well as 
uh, demonstrating a payback if and when we're able to repair that trap. Whereas the benefit of an instantaneous trap monitor is that it can send a signal instantly in real time um, uh, wirelessly to um, uh, a BMS system, to a laptop, maybe even to a mobile phone to tell the maintenance manager, the utilities manager, the energy manager to tell them that they've got a problem and to give them the opportunity to deal with that problem uh, instantly. So. So far, we've addressed what we'd refer to as a traditional steam trapping station. And we also we always refer to a steam trap, uh, steam trapping station because it reminds us that a steam trap should be installed with a number of other ancillaries. For example, the strainer, the check valve, the isolating valves and so forth. So with a traditional steam trapping station, that can bring a number of challenges because it can be difficult to install. We've got a number of potential leak paths. Uh, there's a huge amount of bracketry. We've got the risk of galvanic corrosion as we've got dissimilar metals. All of these components need to be installed in the correct sequence and the correct flow configuration. So for that reason, certain steam trap types are available in what we call a modular pattern. That's essentially where all of the components that you can see up in the top left have been brought together in the same casting. So that brings us a number of different benefits. First of all, it means, for one, we've minimized those leak paths that could otherwise have existed. It's smaller in footprint, so it's easy to install and bracket together. It means that we've got less of a opportunity for an incorrect flow configuration or incorrect sequence of components. And it's also cost effective to now manufacture it out of a high grade stainless steel material. So those two types of steam trapping stations, the traditional and the modular, typically a client will have a preference written into their site standards, but it's just to make you familiar with that terminology in the event that you may be speaking to a manufacturer or an installing contractor uh, that may ask an end using site what their preference may be. So there's obviously a lot of different standards um, with regards to the manufacturer of steam traps. I think perhaps the, uh, the, the most important one here is, is shown down at the bottom of the screen, which is ISO 7842. And that essentially helps steam trap manufacturers to benchmark the capacities of their steam traps. So as a steam as a steam using site, if you wanted to get an understanding of the capacity of a particular trap, you'd have confidence that if it was ISO 78482 certified, you'd have confidence that it had the same capacity and it was benchmarked in exactly the same way against any other manufacturer that was certified to the same standard. So I'd like to thank you very much for spending the time to go through today's presentation with us. Hopefully it's given you a better insight with regards to what's important with regards to sizing, selecting and installing steam traps. I'd just like to remind us that the main purpose of a steam trap is to remove condensate, but also to help with the passage of air from um, a steam distribution network. Some steam trap types are very, very good at venting air. Other steam trap types are not. So it's for that reason that we always encourage you to consider air venting as an entirely separate issue. We're aware of the value of removing the condensate. So we want to ensure that we get the condensate back to the boiler house as quickly as possible. But we know that any pressure drop of condensate passing across the trap is likely to result in that flash steam. So just as it's important to size and select a steam trap correctly, it's important that we size the condensate pipe work upstream and downstream of the trap correctly. One without the other is a waste of time. And we also want to ensure that we monitor and maintain the steam traps correctly, bearing in mind that they're not a fit and forget solution. So. Moving forward, any of you that do have an appetite for any formal training that is um, can be undertaken at our training facility in Cheltenham, you can find the information on our uh, on our website. And um, for those of you that are interested in moving forwards with a little bit more 
uh, education and understanding of STEAM systems, you'll be able to see on the screen the topics that we're going to go through in the coming weeks. So thank you once again for attending today's presentation. Um, if you do want to go through it again, then um, it will be uploaded to the IMECE uh, website in the form of a YouTube video in the near future. But please don't hesitate to reach out and contact me if you've got any need for any support or if you should have any questions at any point in the future. So on that point, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to ask Brian or Steve if there have been any questions that need addressing, and I'll, I'll gladly go through them at this point. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Uh, super job, as usual. We've got one question in. We've got a, a couple of minutes. Um, we sometimes see or use uh, vacuum breakers um, on Steam, Steam applications. Uh, given what you've said today about air, is this generally not a good solution where pressure differential is a problem? It really depends on the purpose of the vacuum breaker. Um, obviously, it's beneficial to have a vacuum breaker against uh, tanks and other items of capital equipment. But we do need to bear in mind that any air that is introduced into the system by a vacuum breaker can result in corrosion of the network. So at the same time as we're introducing air through a vacuum breaker, we at least need to allow that air the opportunity to, to, to escape. And we can do that using a thermostatic air vent once the steam system has been pressurized again. Okay. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, there's nothing else come in. Um, got a couple of minutes. Could, could I ask a, a question? Dan, yep, by all, means, by all means. Um, maintenance of steam traps, um, the, the, the maintenance teams on site, is there any specific training that Spyrax offer for the, the guys that will actually do the hands-on maintenance of traps? Uh, yes, um, we, can, uh, we can offer that training either on a client's site if there's sufficient numbers or sufficient headcount, or we can do that down at our facility in Cheltenham. Uh, we've typically got a preference for doing it down at Cheltenham where we can demonstrate steam trap operation on our on our live rig. And we've got a number of steam traps that have got inherent faults built into them. And we can train the various maintenance personnel to spot this, to spot these uh, faults, rectify them and to understand what the uh, what the implications can be. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. That's thanks, Dan. Okay, uh, guys. Well, uh, we've come to the the end of our time. So, um, all I'd like to do is thank um, the IMEC E for um, for helping us put these put the show on. That's um, Nikki and Fiona. Thank you. And as always, a big thank you to Spyrax Sarko UK, Dan and and Steve. Thanks for your time and appreciate the support that Spyrax Sarko UK give to the IMEC E. Um, and also um, the team back at Project Solutions who support me being able to do this. So uh, hopefully you guys have all enjoyed a, a, another great uh, lecture and we'll be back in a, in a fortnight's time. So thanks very much. Bye. Okay. Thank you.